Luke Skywalker <laughs> approves of my philosophy. That's awesome. <laughs> and they were talking Man. about kids being nervous about going up on stage. And the person, the teacher asked Mark Hamill, what should I tell the kids about being nervous? And he made some sort of a joke. My answer was, if you can learn how to tell yourself that being nervous is actually you being excited because from a physiological point of view, they're damn near identical. You can't really yeah. tell them apart until you move into anxiety, right? That's that's a whole different game. Well, it's debilitating, so yeah, it's right. Different. But can you because anxiety is kind of a downward spiral, right? You yeah. start with nervous, but if you can tell yourself that nervousness is actually being excited, yeah. you could use it to really, really mess some stuff up. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Service Monster Podcast. My name is Joe Kowalski, and I am your host. Today, we're going to do a deep dive into the Service Monster development process. Exactly how does your idea go from your idea to a real boy within Service <laughs> Monster? Uh, how do we make that feature aware? How do we approve them? And why aren't all of your amazing genius ideas just instantly put into our product? Uh, but before we do that, some housekeeping. And instead of Adam, Michael's with us today. Yep. Uh, Adam's like, what is he doing? Surfing or playing guitar? Like, what is he doing? Just know. chilling? Taking a much deserved break. Yeah, a little nap. Much deserved little vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So, uh, yeah, we miss him, but we have brought uh, Mr. Michael in to talk about the new release we did this week yep. and any updates with Service Monster and some of your questions on Smug. So, what do we have today, Michael? Um, well, first off, uh, new release this week, version 6.3.5, uh, has 12 new features in it, uh, 19 bug fixes, um, nothing crazy big in terms of features, but a lot of little uh, feature improvements and bug fixes that um, I think a lot of the a lot of the users are going to be very happy about. Some of them they've been waiting for for a while. Yeah, yeah, some and, of them are and smug I'll Take things. a minute to say, I know we got off to a little bit of a rough start and had to throw a number of hot fixes in order to get those whack-a-mole down, and I wasn't really going to bring that up, but uh, I don't think it can go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about our development process. Yeah. So when you go, hmm, how, how can you do that? You just put bugs in it so we have something to talk about? Marty, <laughs> uh, then, uh, you know, we're, we're going to dive into that too, if you're interested, but yeah, so it should be good by the time this thing airs. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> should be all fixed and smoothed over and great. Um, so the first thing that, um, this was a common one. Adam touched on it last week a little bit is batch converting order types. Um, that's been released. I know a lot of people in smug were talking about that. It's been a pretty common thing. Um, do you have anything you want to say no, about cool. that? No, it's cool. You go yeah. to an order list and you select a bunch of things and you say convert these all to and uh, off off they go. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty useful for people who maybe aren't as um, consistent with their catch up. Um, yeah. yeah they their catch up catch work. Up. Yeah. They, yeah. they need to, because I think, you know, a lot of people, they get busy and it's hard to, um, you know, stay caught up on some of those um, converting the order types. And so. And Seems that like will it's good for do some things, right? Yeah. Um, trigger certain actions in the system, mm -hmm. but payments and that kind of mm -hmm. thing, you're still going to be responsible for that. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be implementing other batch conversion stuff. Um, the system is flexible enough to allow us to do things like a batch update on a single field. So okay. let's say you wanted to select, select a bunch of accounts and turn their lead source to a specific thing. Mm -hmm. right? This is the first go of a system that will handle that. And once we understand how that all works, implementing that uh, and extending those capabilities is relatively simple. Cool. So yeah, look for that in the future. I know. That's exciting. Um, we also had some UI updates to the activity panel screen. Um, I'm not totally sure what they all were, but I know that it's just, you know, improvement for people, the, the whole experience um, of people, of whatever people need to use on the activity panel. They're, yeah. It's going to be drove, a little nicer for them. I drove most of those. Yeah. Um, I went through it, and it was it was all right. Mm -hmm. um, Ethan did a pretty good job gluing together the concept, um, but okay. there were just some smoothing, polishing yeah. yep. 
that I wanted. Uh, I think that helped make it a little more usable. Then some people had reported some issues or misunderstandings, and we got those cleared up as well. Mm -hmm. So I think overall, uh, it's just a much smoother process. And you can kind of put a check mark in this one and call this 1.0 done for the activities panel. Cool. Um, Another big thing, uh, feature addition, is uh, we added a data tag specifically for um, SMS so that users can send their invoice page to the customers via text. Um, My understanding of it is that it's a different data tag than the one that was used um, to send over the over the internet like in an email and I think before was the issue that um, we had some HTML showing up and it was because it was the same template that was being used or the same um, yeah I guess the same template that was being used in emails was being used in texts therefore the HTML was not showing up like it should have because it was a text not an email yes I think that was it kind of roughly yes all yeah. of that is true yes but you did say a lot of words I did so let me see if I can shrink that down uh, I was trying to figure it out in my own brain as we were going there. It's texting kind of confusing. a link to payment is fixed. No yep. longer shows the gobbledygook. You just get the link that they can tap on to yep. make the payment. However, you must change the data tag in your SMS template to use yep. the new data tag, which doesn't have the gobbledygook. Yep. You do that, and that will go away, and your users will be able to click on that from a text and pay their invoice. Booyah. Yep. Seems pretty simple. Just got to make sure that whoever is using this, that you make sure to get use the SMS template for the texts, the email one for emails. Yep. They are separate. They do the same thing, but yep. separate functions. Um, but I, I think everything should be good to go with that now. No more issues. Um, probably better just to have them separate anyways. So, yep. you know, if people want to change the wording or whatever. Right. Because you need, you know, yeah. you need all of the gobbledygook in an email yeah. Yeah. in order for it to show up correctly. Yeah. So but not in text. So. No. Yep. Um, for bug fixes then, um, there was a Google routing issue um, that should be fixed now. Um, I remember seeing some smug posts about that. I believe it was. Um, I don't remember. Some, it was something with activities case. when people added in an activity in their schedule, then it would stop. It wouldn't show jobs after the activity for hmm. the day. It was a weird just issue with that. I don't really okay. know why. But yeah, All that's better. apparently hopefully is better now. Yeah. Should be. Um, we'll see if anyone reports any issues with that. But I think that'll be happy. So people's schedules are all showing up at once on Google. Um, also had a bug fix for the reminders list. So I believe it was just an update to make it more organized and make it more similar to SM5. Um, one of those things where users wanted it to be, um, you know, but the way we did it in SM5, I guess, was the way they liked it and right. just kind of. Do it again. To that, yeah. yeah. Why didn't yeah. you give that? It was yeah. great. Yeah. I mean, if it worked then, I mean, might as well. You know, it's newer in SM6, but yep. people like it. You know, that's what we want. Awesome. Give them a product that they like and can <laughs> use, right? That's the yeah, goal. That's <laughs> certainly the goal. <laughs> certainly the goal, yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's it for version 6.3.5. Um, there's a lot more uh, bug fixes we're gonna and features in it. We're going to have a uh, release notes post out um, early next week okay. about that. Uh, Brenda is currently working on that to really get it dialed in and get all the necessary information in there. Um, so it should be out by the time they have, hear this podcast. Yeah, it should be out. And, yeah. it, and it'll be linked in the in the Show description. Notes. Yeah. Um, on YouTube for the audio. Unfortunately, I'll have to like actually go to our social media to find it. But, uh. you know, oh no. But anyways. Um, or you could just go to servicemonster.net forward slash blog. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's the easiest way yeah. if you're going to yeah. have to go manually. Yeah. Um, so real quick before we go into smug posts, I actually saw an interesting uh, post on a pro window cleaning group on Facebook. Um, the question that this user phrased to just anyone else in the group was, before you opened your own business, were you nervous about it? Uh, I looked through the responses and about 90% roughly of the people who responded said, yes, they were nervous before they opened their business. There was a lot of discussion, though, about, you know, yeah, I was confident, uh, but there was an element of being nervous to it. Um, You know, it can be a big, big deal. You got to make money. You have to support a family in a lot of lot of situations. Um, So I was just curious for you, Joe, like if you could briefly tell us about when you started Service Monster back in 2003. Yeah, 2003. Were you nervous? (laughs) And kind of what was the what was your mindset like? 
during during that period when you were transitioning from other work to starting your own company? That's a very complicated answer. Figured it would be. <laughs> yeah. Um, the actual question is, was I nervous? And I guess the answer would be, I'm not sure how you would classify nervous. Right? It is kind of subjective, yeah. It is. And there's a scale, right, from anxiety, mm -hmm. like totally freaking the hell out and just falling down into a puddle of mush and not being able to do anything. Yep. And I'm seeing that more and more frequently. Mm -hmm. um, to, you know, butterflies in your stomach. Mm -hmm. I picked up a ridiculous trait way early in my game uh, in um, like a sandball baseball group with a coach that was pretty awesome. And it's turning. Oh, and before I throw the punchline, okay. I have an interesting story. I threw this punchline at a thread that was a question posted to Mark Hamill. And my answer got ranked top. Mark Hamill liked it and responded with like, you know, kind of a thumbs up type of emoji. Nice. I'm like, holy shit, Luke Skywalker <laughs> approves of my philosophy. That's awesome. And they were talking <laughs> about kids being nervous about going up on stage. And the person, the teacher asked Mark Hamill, what should I tell the kids about being nervous? And he made some sort of a joke. My answer was, if you can learn how to tell yourself that being nervous is actually you being excited because from a physiological point of view they're damn near identical you can't really yeah. tell them apart until you move into anxiety right that's that's a whole different game it's debilitating so yeah it's right different. but can you because anxiety is kind of a downward spiral mm -hmm. right you yeah. start with nervous but if you can tell yourself that nervousness is actually being excited yeah you could use it to really, really mess some stuff up. Seriously. <laughs> and so I learned that as a kid. I had a coach yeah. that was able to kind of make the light bulb for me go off there. And cool. so, and then it, ne it never was an issue for me, which is created an opportunity as I was a front man in a band. You know, I th had an 85 mile an hour fastball and I was throwing for little league world championships. You know, like none of that stuff bothered me because I was just always freaking excited. Okay. Now, I didn't start Service Monster, though, until after I got punched in the mouth with cancer. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I was too fearful. I was had a growing family. I went from minimum wage to a $90,000 cubicle. That's pretty badass for uneducated. Yet, I had something that said I need to throw that cubicle away and go start something. And I wasn't even sure what. And then when I had cancer and started wondering why I was making so much money for other people, I was like, I just need to do my own thing. And so then I went on a mission to learn and, and kind of grow and self-reflect in those areas uh, for about a year and a half and learned what not to do in a startup with a, another company I uh, was a junior partner with. By the time I started Service Monster, I was excited when I got the first check, which allowed us to actually open the door. Right. It was small. It was like a 50K mm -hmm. friends and family type, right? Yeah. Desperately needed in order to move forward. Um, so, you know, I don't want to undervalue its worth. Um, but the investments that we put in the service monster, because we bootstrapped it, they were minimal compared to what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. Was I nervous? I was excited to finally see if I could make a go of it on my own. And, and I was ready to prove myself. Oh, maybe over eager at times. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but, you know, we were doing things that no one else had done yet. Yeah. SAS didn't exist. So I don't know how fair it is because, you know, what drives me is taking massively complex systems and then breaking them really down into their finite, simple parts and being able to manage that and put it together and grow. That's like, you know, I have a big passion for that. So, I was excited to be able to work mm -hmm. on building the systems the way I wanted to build them right? without the constraint of uh, a figure over me telling me how, how they needed to be done. Yep. Was I nervous that I was going to fail? Next to cancer, like what's the worst that can happen? I got to go back and work for somebody else? Never had a problem finding a job. So 
maybe that's a safety net, right? Yeah. There's a saying, burn the ships. Mm-hmm. What you're really saying is don't give your troops an out. Like if there's an out, there's a there's a a way to go get out. But mm-hmm. if there's no way out, the only way is forward is through the front lines. Mm-hmm. Guess what? <laughs> They're going to fight harder. Yeah. You know, individually, you're like that, too. So um, I didn't have to burn the ships. I felt comfortable with that. And so I just pushed. Now, I have lots of people, mentors or coaches have run across the years who said, 15 years, dude, that's a long time for where you're at. True. Totally true. Doesn't mean I'm wrong with where we're headed. I just got started way early in the game, and I made a couple major mistakes that we were able to weather that I hope will have big payoffs over the next five years. Yep. So... Was I nervous? <laughs> uh, yeah, only uh, – no, uh-uh, I wasn't nervous. I was excited. Because your nervousness that would have been there, you were conditioned to really just channel that as excitement. That, Sounds like that. More, yeah. And the stakes were low for me. Yeah, so it's just – yeah. I could have probably got confident. another $80,000 a year job within four weeks, yeah, right? So it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good perspective, you know? Thanks yeah. for sharing. That's definitely – probably unique um given the cancer right before that and then um definitely unique perspective yeah so if you really want to business have the perspective of an entrepreneur get cancer (laughs) i don't suggest (laughs) it but if you happen to like it's a kick-ass motivator or almost die or you know whatever use it to your advantage use a crappy how can you not situation i didn't die holy shit i'm still around for my kids how can you not be grateful every day Exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, on that I note, I spent too much time on that probably, but it's okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's interesting. I'm sure people want to hear it. Um, so yeah, let's go on to our smug discussion now. So we have a few posts from this past week. Um, uh, first one's from Eric. Um, Eric posted about, um, basically a feature request, uh, that has come up a lot. I've seen come up a lot in the past of wanting to keep the work order number the same for recurring jobs. You've seen um, this a lot? Yeah, I've well, heard about it a lot, I guess. Really? From um, Adam and Javi both. Okay. From anyone, because we, we have, a, we have, we have some loop. customers in the janitorial services oh, industry. gotcha. And they all ask for this type of feature because they bill tend to bill monthly. Therefore, they need to have, my understanding of it at least from reading the comments, is um, that they want to have multiple, multiple jobs all on the same work order so that they're all the same invoice so that when the invoice it's just one thing but it has multiple jobs on it i guess yeah it's it's my one understanding, order yeah. multiple jobs through a recurrence pattern yes yes that's the deal yes so being able to just like recurrence is set up a recurrence pattern mm-hmm. but instead of it making an, a new invoice every time yeah maybe it makes an invoice on some frequency yeah like monthly i'm kind of yeah. tossing it in my head kind of where we might want to use that but mm-hmm. we should be able to make a minor modification recurrences which will behave this way but there'll be a number of things we'll need to address mm-hmm. including some automated systems uh and you know again resources mm-hmm. so he asked me what's the chance of it getting in i was like on oh, long enough timeline 100 mm-hmm. percent oh yeah <laughs> But, I, you know, I'm trying to mull it over right now. Yeah. So that's where we're at. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that's good. I think the comments on that, too, um, you, you chimed in quite a lot there. And yeah. So there's, well, you just, there's solid answers You there. just upvoted it by, like, 50 by saying, like, we have a whole class of clients mm-hmm. that have been asking for this yeah. feature. Yeah. And that's my understanding from yeah, Adam I was, and Hobby I both. wasn't aware. So that's yeah. super I don't know awesome. how many there are, but I have heard it repeatedly. Yeah. That's um, great. And Jordan asked about, um, basically, I think what he was trying to do is voiding, he was voiding work orders um, for whatever reason, and he was removing them from the schedule, but they still needed a record of the job. Um, he was giving kind of use cases as uh, for callbacks, prepaid commercial work. Um, apparently, SM5 did not have this problem, and so he wanted to know more about if it's possible to have a record of the job still exist, even when you void out the work order. And I think the comments, there were some um, 
some kind of workarounds that people had. Um, yeah. I thought this was another bug, to be honest. So now I'm trying to reorient myself. Um, or that use case where it was the result of the user using SM5. Let me that look. Adam and I talked about last week. So that's why I had that kind of warp. Oh. So this is a different one. So let, let me, me explain me <laughs> what I think it should do. I don't know if this is what it does, to be honest. Uh, but we'll be making some changes on that pipeline between mm -hmm. what we expect and uh, what it actually does here shortly. Um, if you void an order, any jobs that are upcoming are automatically set to canceled. Mm. And that way they're removed from the schedule. Okay. Visits that have already been marked as complete should stay on the schedule. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not sure if SM5 renders that way and then SM6 simply doesn't draw any of the jobs. I'm not 100% sure. So I know we had some discussions. I'm just not recalling it off the top of my head yeah. right now. I know it's been sent to yeah. development for as a tracker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. Um, I was looking at the comments on it right here and I pulled it up, and you you were involved in that mm -hmm. kind of asking for the use case with that. Um, it sounds like everyone's kind of on the same page. It sounds like you were able to kind of identify what they um, were looking for with that. Okay. Um, it says it's on something to do with, with rework. Um, yeah, I'm not totally sure what the use case is, but they. Um, it's well, in like there. he says yeah. here, callbacks, prepaid, commercial yeah. work, etc. Yeah, I think they just wanted they wanted to still have the job like on the schedule, even if it was voided. Like that sounds show like that we'll it's be voided. heading for a setting at some yeah. point. Or, you that know, sounds pretty show dual, pretty show doable, void right? show. Yeah jobs from voided orders yeah. or something. I mean, that should be something that's doable in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Settings okay. should be. Yeah. And I think that that would just, again, help out people with more niche use cases that maybe we're not accustomed to as much. Yep. Um, that'd be good to have that. Um, so this is kind of the, okay, we're, we're moving on to the, uh, the big one, the big question from this week. <laughs> so Tim, Tim. asked, um, I'll just read what he said. He said, Joe Kowalski tagged you in it. Looking for some exciting releases in the areas of Zapier, SM6 Schedule UI, and the new mobile app. When can we expect some of these things? I don't want to hear they are in final QA or whatever. Let's get some concrete timetables here. Now your response was... Nope. <laughs> care to expand on that now? <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. Um, we'll talk about our development process, why we don't really give out timelines mm -hmm. shorter or longer than like two to four weeks. Yeah. Um, and uh, what goes through the whole process of how bugs and features are tracked and developed and worked on yep. uh, for those who care to see. So for that, I'd like to bring on, I'm kicking you out, Michael. That's okay. Yeah, and My I'm going to <laughs> bring on uh, Ethan, who I've talked about on occasion, but He's uh, my son, Ethan Kowalski. He's been working uh, at Service Monster now for almost five years. He's uh, going to be 19 here in a few months and um, has been involved in the QA process, the push process. Now he's kind of a full stack dev, which is great. Super nice. cheap, super <laughs> cheap full stack developer. Yeah. And uh, basically does whatever I want him to do. Cool. Well, <laughs> thanks everyone. You know, it was great to get to host like this first time actually yeah. like filling in for Adam. So, um, yeah, cool. Pass it off to Ethan and you guys go crazy awesome. answering Tim's question and a lot more. Yeah. So <laughs> thanks, right. Michael. Thanks Joe. Yep. So Ethan, welcome. Yeah. Hi. Did I hear you're not paying me enough? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're a funny guy. Um, so, yeah, we, we don't do timelines. We don't do uh, a release patterns while predictable change quite a bit. So we'll answer Tim's question, but it's going to take 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you – I know you did some preparation work because, you know, mm -hmm. usually I just come and sit down and do stuff. So 
Uh, what did you bring to the table related to our bug release cycle and so forth? Mostly just an outline of you know the, the life cycle of a tracker, um, where it comes in, how how it goes through the process, and you know when it ends up as a feature or a, or a fixed bug. A couple of potential questions, stuff like that. Good. Yeah, so uh, it's born in the minds of our users or in the clicks of our users. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, sometimes we will log user, not just behavior, but it, when an error occurs, we can capture that. And we can go through those logs sometimes and chase bugs that way through user uh, interaction unbeknownst to them. But a lot of the times it's going to be feedback from either users or internal staff. And they'll call up. Or they'll send us an email, support at servicemonster.net. Or they'll make a smug post, that one's... Or they'll make a smug post, right? That's a pretty apparent. Um, or they'll do an in-app ticket, right? So you can open up a chat window, or you can even open up the support ticket and submit a bug there. Okay, and then uh, support grabs it. Then what? Um, they pretty much stick it in the system, actually. Um, from where support is, it's pretty indiscriminate. You know, we get a report. Maybe if we get two or three reports, a tracker gets made. Um, and we, we have that tracker, and we have a lot of those, obviously, because if we're not oh, picking we have and thousands choosing. in the backlog. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's just the backlog of trackers. Um, and then what, what happens after that is Brenda or, uh, or Sierra, but I think it's going to go to Adam. Right, is, one of the support people or uh, one of the support to engineering liaisons we yeah, have. Right. Brenda, Brenda's the big one is... Um, they verify it. So what they do is they look at the tracker, they look at the steps, and they see if they can recreate it. If they can't, then it, it kind of just ends there a lot of the time if it's a bug. Right. Because if you can't recreate it, then it's probably just an, an issue with data. It's Sometimes that happens, but it's pretty rare. Most of the time it's able to be recreated, and that gets kind of can promoted a little bit. And as you say, I can verify this, or if it's a feature request, I can verify that this is worth looking into. Those kind of go through a separate pipeline, but um, so they get recreated and then they get assigned a priority, basically saying, okay, how important is this and how many people is it affecting? Because mm -hmm. those are two different things that you have to have to consider. If there's something that completely breaks the app, but affects one person, it's important, obviously. Especially if you're that one person. Right. Right. But we have thousands of users and there are things that might take a little bit of precedent over that. Right. Um, just just by volume of people that it's messing with. Um, so it goes to it, it goes to there and then it when gets... When it's created there, we call that a tracker. So anytime I refer to trackers in the system, whether it's a bug or a feature, at this stage, now it's been verified, it's moved, it's kind of mm -hmm. been that graduating stage. We have kind of an official tracker right right and i think the official term internally is work item but that's not as catchy gotcha <laughs> <laughs> engineers right. marketers are better naming things mm -hmm. um yeah actually the next step is that conversion because it'll it'll get converted and also at the same time it'll get assigned so sierra or adam will look at it and go okay, I'm, I'm looking at what this issue is and I'm going to pick which developer is going to work on this. Right. Because all the developers have different... Skill sets. Know, right, right. Different specialties. Different strengths. Most of them can work with the whole stack if sure. they need to. Right. But you're not going to give a server-side bug to, to Aaron. Right. You don't need to. It's not his, his strong suit compared to the rest of the team. Um, Did you hear that, Aaron? Ethan's talking smack about you. <laughs> I don't know if he's over there. No, no, it's because he's wasted <laughs> when he could be on the client instead. Yeah, <laughs> true. So it, it it gets assigned, and you know we have what four or five SM six devs at this yeah. point. Yeah, like five. Um, and there's 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 a couple little guidelines. It's kind of a play by ear thing that we're gonna have to to um teach the new people right. is who gets what. Because occasionally someone like a dev will get something across their plate. I did actually just a few days ago that I'm looking at now. I have no idea what to do with this. This isn't this isn't me. <laughs> you go throw it to someone else time. Right. Uh, and then, you know, that kind of brings us into the next step is development. Yes. It's on a developer's well, what's plate. A, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's mm -hmm. a big step in between. Because developers develop out of buckets called sprints. Right. And so what we have is we take all of the features and all of the bugs that we have that are in the system, thousands of them, 
and we kind of look at that ranking and we look at where the big bangs are, right, for the resources that we have. And then we prioritize those and we kind of group them together. They kind of gravity pull certain ones together. And then we try to grab approximately two to four weeks worth of work based off the resources that we can assign to it. Mm -hmm. And those are called sprints. Okay. So when you hear me talking about sprints, that's what it is. It's a group of features with a with a date that we want to release that's usually two to four weeks out. And that's kind of why we don't have, you know, further release dates is because everything beyond that next sprint is it hasn't been grouped yet. It's pretty nebulous. It could be in the sprint after that. It right. could be three sprints from now. It just depends on when it makes sense. Or something that is a hot to trot three months ago suddenly is now less relevant when compared to other things that need to be done. Mm-hmm. And so that timeline can slip. Or let's say you're planning on X number of resources, but then one individual decides to take two weeks vacation time during that particular sprint. Now you have less resources to work with and those certain trackers and features might not get done and they'll have to get moved to the next sprint. Um, Mm -hmm. And so this is all a real delicate balance, balancing the priorities every time because those priorities will change. Uh, and, and we have to be mindful of that else we develop an app no one cares about. And there'll be some people who are like, man, I thought this thing was going to be fixed because it's a pain point to the five people. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, but the rest, our prioritization mechanism at least determined that it was more viable for us to go after other things at that moment in time. Which, of course, is unfortunate if you're one of those five people. Right. Because then you might get stuck with that thing for a little longer than you might want. Yeah. And if if you're hoping for, well, just tell me when it'll be done, and we give you a date, and then something happens, like we lose our QA, <laughs> or we <laughs> our, lose Alex, which is something both things have happened within the last 60 days, mm-hmm. 90 days. Is it really only 90 days since Alex left? Yeah, I'm going to say 90 days. is principal focus time. It could be longer than that. I don't know. Has it been six months? Yeah, it's been a while. Well, again, I had plans for Sierra, but then she had other plans. So um, we'll bring in uh, somebody who can test it so we can move forward. But that's going to hold things up, too. Mm -hmm. So life happens. And, you know, I don't want to throw out promises of dates of features that go into sprints that might get bumped or might get stretched because then you're going to make decisions based off those dates. So what I'd rather have people do is work with the product that we have and go deep on that. Are you using that to its fullest capability. If there's a friction point, which is just causing your business massive pain, then, you know, I I understand if you needed to make a business decision based off that. I'm not going to promise that something's going to be ready in two months when I very well know that it might slip and it could be three or four months. And I could have some pretty pissed off people if they've made business decisions based off off those promises. So that's why we don't do dates. That's just it. On the flip side of that, it puts a lot of pressure on the devs. And you say, okay, I have this date. And the devs going, well, that's not going to – it's going to take me longer than that to finish it. Yeah, especially if they run into issues. And then then you get uh, half-cocked, and that's actually – you get more bugs that way. That's right. When you get development that's rushed to fill a date. That's right. It's just – it's not the best way to do it. And I've been in those environments too. And Mm -hmm. and that's not to say that we can't get the developers to have a sense of urgency around certain big pushes. Mm -hmm. But they've got to be on board with it. They've got to understand the why. And then they also have to understand it's not freaking forever. This isn't a sweat shop for Blizzard, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Or a a Microsoft place where they, like, don't mind people taking meth. (laughs) It's because they know they're going to get 18 hours out of them. So it's not, you know, it's not like that. Uh, We want our engineers to develop quality work. And if they run into issues, be okay with saying, ah, dang it. In, in their stand-up or in their scrum, hey, I got an issue. It might take me a little bit longer. We call them black holes. Is, yeah. <laughs> you run into something and you realize this is a whole big nest. And yeah. And oftentimes it's because the engineer doesn't necessarily want to rewind and start over down a different path. And so they'll <laughs> hold on to that path a lot longer than they maybe should. Um, and then either punch through or have to go back to the beginning anyways. But the punch through is always weak. So anyways, there's a whole psychology to development and you know, how you push forward and mini victories and all that kind of stuff. So managing those resources, um, I, you know, it, it's we're trying to figure out 
how to do it the best way that we can. And we're modeled after kind of corporate America in our development practices, not in the development themselves because my insane architecture, but um, the process by which, and, and that has its own flaws. You know, it's come to my attention even over, over the last two or months, uh, developers are starting to lose the why behind doing what we do. We have on the other side of the wall, support, marketing, sales, uh, admin, we're all together making decisions about what goes in the bucket and how that gets prioritized. Mm -hmm. And we've turned the developers into a code shop where they just grab their tracker and they crank it out and they're done. But I think sometimes they're losing the, why are we doing this? Because then it gives them caring about how the whole process end to end is. And, you know, if, if a developer knows why a customer needs something, they're less likely to make a decision that doesn't quite align with that and instead aligns with the tracker they were given. That's right. You know, you, you want to do the job not just in a way that will check off the box, but in a way that will actually make sense for how the user is going to use it. That's right. Um, and I think probably every dev here has developed something and then you've looked at it and gone, yeah, but I want to use it like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, which actually... Uh, if you're dealing with a, we, we talked about the life cycle of a bug, but if you're dealing with a feature request instead, right. which we do get quite a lot of, right. um, instead of kind of getting verified and recreated, because you can't recreate something that doesn't exist, well, we go through kind of a product team where there's a meeting that'll happen where it'll, every once in a while, you know, a couple of these feature requests will get brought up and it'll get talked over and see how and if to implement that. Um, and that happens, you know, before, kind of in step two, like before, you convert it before you assign it to a sprint. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Once it's a sprint, it's pretty easy, right? Developers just crank it out. It gets tested and looked at. It gets approved. It moves through our development pipeline, which we have uh, just development so that we can test it. Then we have a behind the scenes kind of more production environment so we can test it. And then a user acceptance testing so our corporate clients can test it before we release it. And our production pipeline. Which actually, yeah, that brings it up to testing. Because after development's finished, we all you know, merge all the code together. And there's you know, there's three places. And you, you kind of just really briefly touched on this, but I want to expand on it a bit. Where we've got our stage environment. And we're only internal. We have access to it. Yep. And in, you know, we we're looking at stage. We are just doing some internal testing. We package it up after that's done or you know, kick it back to the dead and say, this is broken. Don't make it broken. Right. Um, and it goes to test, which is just a little closer to how production is. And we test it there. And then it goes to production and we test it there. And then we can call it released. Right. And even then, it's going to get in the wild and then we'll have some weird hiccups. Yeah, because look, you can put in two days, you know, two solid days at 16 hours of QA on one feature and in the first five minutes of the feature being released it'll probably be more testing than that just, yeah. just on sheer volume of people that's right and then the, also the different data sets exercise it in mm. different ways uh, and different environments exercise it in different ways and we do as much of that as we can here and again now we're going to have to rebuild the QA department completely <laughs> So yeah, it's it's uh it's a uh, interesting. The whole process is interesting because we deal with thousands of trackers and we have to mm -hmm. angle them. Um, we kind of recognize that those production meetings are interesting because we recognize multiple stakeholders, um, sales, right? They come out and say, "Look, I need a th feature X Y Z because it makes it easier to sell to these this, this individual market." Uh, training will say, "Look, I need features A B C because." A lot of people are getting confused based off the name of this button or how this process flows. Support will come and say, we get a lot of calls after this change was made because the users are confused or don't understand or, you know, we could, can we clarify this? Um, and that's how we go in with those feature sets and mindsets into those meetings so that they each lay stake on their perspective uh, silos as it were right and hopefully that gives us kind of the best idea we can of what the users really want because we're not apple we don't we don't tell the user what they want right we we ask them and we try to figure Sometimes it out Sometimes we own. tell them and if they we do it's me <laughs> just so everybody's aware yeah yeah 
Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much the process. I do have a couple of questions here, but I think we already addressed most of them kind of in the in the whole conversation. But I think the big one is, you know, we have a whole QA department had yeah. a whole QA department. Right. Going to have. Right. Yeah. Why are there still has, bugs? Hasn't. Why why is the app, you know not bug free. Right. Um, obviously we touched on it a little bit, right? In the wild, there's lots of different environments and variables. You could have an extension installed on your Chrome browser that wreaks havoc on Service Monster. We haven't seen one in a while, right? Because we, we kind of fortified ourselves against it. Um, but that's potentially possible. And that could be installed in one machine over a thousand users. Mm -hmm. And so it's point one percent for us. So um, that experience may cause you to be like, well, what the hell? Data sets, again, your data may be a little bit different. I've seen some imports, like, really be the culprit for a lot of weird behavior for an individual <laughs> client. And it, and nobody jumps there at first. That's not their first go-to, right? It's the system is bad. And then our support and, and trainers are, are trained to accept that as fact first. Be empathetic. Listen to the client. Make sure you understand their source of their frustration which means let's go down the same path they do, which is blame the software first. Let's take a look. Let's recreate it. Right. right. And, you know, even I've, I've gotten trackers all the way to my desk that just I look at them and they look like voodoo magic. Like they, they don't make any sense. They don't happen 90 percent of the time. It's only with this one client on the third day of a new moon. Like. Right. Yeah. So um, so there's those those category of bugs. Mm -hmm. And then there are other known bugs that just haven't been fixed yet. And the rule here is. If we have a known bug, it must go in a sprint no more than three sprints deep. So it either must go in the current sprint that everybody's working on if it's hot enough and if it needs addressed. Uh, it must go in the sprint after that if it's kind of a medium or if it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> it, you know, it rolls to the third sprint. But it should a known bug should never survive more than three sprints. And that's that's just a rule for bugs, right? Like if I have a feature request, that isn't going to go. We don't have the resources right. to be able to do that. Right. Not only that, but not everybody's genius idea works for everybody. Everybody's business is a little bit different. Everybody's perspective is a little bit different the way you want to do things. We've got to make sure we cover uh, a, an omnipresent source of users that allow us to, you know, give you guys the flexibility to do what you want to do, but not prohibit people from doing it the way that they want it to do. And it's an interesting balance. It's a fine point. So we're always walking that. But yeah. Um, and then if a bug survives longer than three cycles, then we, we must not know about it. You should let us know. And then things like my screen always has a red red error thing it's like we need to clear those out sometimes we understand them sometimes we don't but that kind of data happens on the client we don't have direct access to it mm -hmm. so don't always assume that we know and please provide as much data as possible i guess this would be a good opportunity to educate our users because right. it's broken is not actionable right and you know i i've been in qa and i've had to deal with the it's broken so a, a good general process is you, if you find something that breaks, you want to narrow it down as much as you can. Uh, and I understand that sometimes it's confusing. You don't know exactly what broke it. But if you can just provide as much information as possible, what, what kind of job you were working on, like um, where you were in the app, the steps you took to get there, what day of the week it was, right? It, it yeah, can be some what really, customer you were working with. can be some really weird, inane stuff, especially if you're working with dates. That gets really confusing. You know, you're working on the schedule and things are... It, it, there's, it's a very complicated app, and there's a lot of stuff that you wouldn't think might have any bearing might actually be the most important part of the piece of data. Right. Um, that being said, don't just stuff it. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> we ought to be able to sift it out. And that's kind of, that's QA's job or verification's job is figuring out what's the important data to bring into the into the tracker. And right. So that the development aren't running around like chickens trying to recreate or figure out what the issue is before they can fix it. Right. And the other, the biggest thing, absolute biggest thing you can do is screenshots. If you take a picture of like, if you take a screenshot of your phone, screenshot of the error, it makes developing about a hundred times easier. Yep, because you can just see it right there. And yeah, that's great advice. Please do that <laughs> more. 
Yeah. Um, and you know, if you press, I think it's F12. Mary Lynn is great about that. She does yeah. uh, videos. Oh, right. Those are awesome. Yeah. Oh, if, if you press just F12 on your keyboard, it'll bring up the, 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 the DevTools console. And if you've had an error, there's a big red line right there. And we want to read that. That really helps. You there lost 99% of the audience. I am right aware. <laughs> <laughs> but for the 1%, please <laughs> <laughs> capture that F12 <laughs> yeah. error code. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing as a developer. And, you know, and then, like, the last reason we still have bugs um, is because development is whack a mole. You yeah. fix a bug, three more pop up somewhere else, and you can't always find those. Yeah, we had, and, and it's for weird reasons, too. Mm -hmm. Aaron's working on the new schedule. Mm -hmm. So during the hot fix period of the last release, which was, you know, a little rough, uh, they had to kick out a couple hot fixes, and most of that was centered around the schedule. Aaron had made a change that caused that schedule to load slightly differently which caused these weird things to pop up all over the place. Uh, and so it wasn't even supposed to be code that was going to production, but merging is so mm -hmm. tenuous, like trying to figure out how all that works. It's That's a art in and of itself, and that's what we're losing uh, temporarily as Sierra's last day yeah, is she's, today. She's our big merge um, manager. Yep, actually, but Matt's going to help manage that too. Actually, you brought up something interesting, which is hot fixes. Yes. They don't do this process. No. If we do a release and we find out there's something bad that went into the release. Yes. We fix it and push a release. Right. It, and we call that a hot fix. Mm -hmm. And we can do that within hours. Yeah, well, what is what would you say is the window for a hot fix? Like, when does you go, okay, we can't hot fix it. Let's make a tracker. Because um, obviously all bugs were hot fixes well, at one point. Number one is business continuity. So we mm -hmm. have this definition by contract, especially with um, companies like ChemDry where we've got to maintain a certain service level. And if we don't maintain that service level, uh, then, you know, we start giving discounts, essentially. It starts hurting us financially. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we've always been aware of it. We always cared. We've never had a quote unquote bad report card or lost any money because of lack of service. But we had to come up with a way to define, well, what's broken, right? Because you can't just say, well, the app's broken, then it's a discount. Okay, what's broken? Because it's uh, not right. two million lines of code <laughs> and like five thousand functions and like what? So um, we define broken as business continuity, being able to see and process jobs on the schedule and add jobs to the schedule. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like you know worst case scenario, you need to be able to do those things. So if anything in that pipeline of business continuity or anything adjacent to it kind of rubs shoulders with it, that could cause a hot fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully the number of these will go way down eventually because we've played with in the past automatic testing on those. Yeah. Where you click a button and the app does all the testing yep. for that business continuity pipeline. Yep. And it's worked varying degrees of effectively i think when we first made it it was really good and then right. it got outdated and it never really caught up right but with the replacement and the um the rebuilding of the qa department that might be something that we talk about mm -hmm. using or not using <laughs> in yep. future totally yes so yeah so i hope that uh, that helped address why we don't do timelines how does a bug or a feature flow through this company how do we manage our resources? And you can, of course, compare it to you guys and doing uh, residential work or accounts, managing those resources and assigning out trucks. And then, oh, shoot, two people called in sick. <laughs> and so now I have all these things on the schedule I still need to deal with. And sometimes you'll move things around. Sometimes you'll have to jump on the truck yourself. I'll still jump in and code and you know, oh, you love that. Don't pretend you don't. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I do. Sometimes, sometimes it's I have other things I really should be doing instead. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, no, it's great. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Ethan. Yep. Appreciate it. And thank you for your attention. Uh, you should go check out the demo if you haven't done so already. It's pretty awesome. And uh, stay up to date. Keep watching. Keep listening. See you on the flip side.